carcasses pay attention to cleanliness as much as they should. There can be bed bugs and other pests around that you won't notice until it's too late. So here's the deal. When you arrive at a hotel and open your room, don't rush to open your bags and put all your clothes onto the shelves, and especially the bed. Better place your bags into the bathtub for the time being, and go check the room for those pesky bugs. Check out all the rugs, soft furniture, cushions, and all other places that pests could live in. Only after you've done that, take your bags out of the bathtub and unpack. The bathtub is the safest place because no bugs are able to survive there. So naturally, none of them will crawl into your stuff while you're not looking. You may want to throw that comforter on the floor at once, by the way. While sheets may be cleaned regularly, the comforters are not. Some hotels wash them every week or so, but others don't even bother. Same goes for your bedding. Most high-end hotels will change the sheets daily, but a lot of budget ones don't change the pillows or bedding after a guest checks out. Definitely a good idea to request fresh pillowcases when you arrive. It's also best not to drink out of that glass in the bathroom, as many glasses aren't cleaned properly. Some workers even use disinfectant or furniture polish to get the glasses looking spotless. Ever wondered why they never use fitted sheets in hotels? They might be convenient, but they're impractical for hotel use. The sheets are changed much more often than you do it at home, and the elastic becomes worn out all too soon. Besides, it's a nightmare to store fitted sheets. They have to be of two different sizes, one for either type of bed. It's just easier to take two universal flat sheets per double bed and get on with it. Speaking of sheets, you must have noticed that bed linen and towels in hotels are almost always white. The first reason is convenience, of course. When everything is white, it's easy to wash it all together and use bleach to get rid of any possible stains. The second explanation, however, is customer experience. According to public polls, people perceive a white color as luxurious and fresh, which makes their stay more pleasant. If you see an unusually attractive wow. price for a room on a website, be careful. It might not include a mandatory resort fee. If you have an option to pay for a room in advance, you'll see the final cost at the checkout. It'll normally list the initial price you saw before booking and all the extra charges, resort fee included. If you decide to pay at the hotel, though, you might be up for a surprise when you check out, so always make sure to read the fine print. You may have seen a rather weird thing in many hotels, a phone in the bathroom, especially just next to the toilet. You'd probably be surprised to know that it's an actual requirement for hotels to receive a four-diamond rating from AAA. But this also makes pretty good sense. For example, if you slip and fall on the wet floor of the bathroom, a phone can be handy to call for help. Returning to bathrooms, hotels typically don't provide plungers in rooms. You see, hotels want you to have a feeling that you're the first person ever to enter the room you're staying in. It's a question of your comfort, which is the primary concern of any respectable hotel. And a plunger in the bathroom, according to anonymous polls, makes people think that the toilet may malfunction at some point, which doesn't help the image. If your hotel has card keys with magnetic strips, make sure you put your card key apart from your cell phone and wallet. The problem is that key cards are rewritten quite a lot, and they're designed for that process to be quick and easy. So a fairly strong magnet, like the one in your cell phone, could erase your key card, and you wouldn't be able to get inside your room. The hotel will surely provide you with a new card, but that's still inconvenient. Many hotels only accept credit cards as a form of payment, and without one, you won't be able to book a room directly or use the paid services provided by the place. Booking a room is just the first step of your stay at a hotel. During your vacation or business trip, you might use the mini bar or other paid services that you'll only have to pay for at the checkout. If your debit card doesn't have enough funds on it to cover all your expenses, the hotel has no means to get their money apart from suing you. If you pay with a credit card, however, all the additional costs go to the bank, and everyone's happy. The time of check-in and check-out is fixed not to annoy you. It's done so you don't barge in onto guests who stayed in the room you booked, and the hotel staff can clean the room and prepare it for the next guest's arrival. By the way, the check-out time is normally about 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. because hotels actually care about your well-being. 
they not only let you have your breakfast, but also give you some time to prepare for departure without hurry. Isn't it kind of annoying that many hotels don't have a socket near the bed? In fact, time is to blame in this case. Lots of hotels around the world were built before mobile phones and other portable devices became so popular and widespread. Back then, of course, they didn't need bedside sockets, and many of them haven't yet caught up with the times. You can avoid this issue if you stay at a hotel that's been built relatively recently. Once you're at the check-in desk, it's likely that the hotel staff already recognize you. Many hotels, especially higher-end ones, will do a little research of their guests' social media. While this seems a bit creepy, it's only so they can see who you are to make your stay more comfortable. At check-in, you'll also be given an initial key which will reset the door lock and cancel any existing keys. But make sure to be respectful to your receptionists. Sometimes, they may play practical jokes on rude customers by key bombing. This is where they give you two of the initial keys. Either key resets the door, so once you use the second one, the first will no longer work. Toothpaste is one item you probably won't find in the hotel room's bathroom. For budget hotels, it's often too expensive to order, as it's classified as a medical supply. For luxury hotels, it's the opposite. They often can't find a toothpaste manufacturer that's fancy enough to be present in their rooms. While the staff clean hotel rooms frequently, disinfecting smaller items is not on the top of their priority list. Remote controls and phones are some of the dirtiest things in a hotel room. So do yourself a favor and bring some disinfectant wipes to clean them before use. If you're thinking about putting your valuables in the safe for security, you may also want to think twice. Hotel locks use passcodes instead of locks, so there's a high chance someone in the hotel will know the master code. And who knows who else could get their hands on this information. Hotels usually overbook themselves, as the average daily no-show rate is around 10%. This means there's a chance that you won't actually get your reserved room. If you show up and there are no available rooms, chances are you'll get walked. This basically means the hotel will pay for a room at another similar hotel in the area. There's a surprising amount of items left in rooms that hotels don't want you to know about. In one hotel in Portugal, a worker even found a shark that was left behind. With no idea how it ended up there, the shark was eventually returned to its natural habitat, safe and sound. Most, if not all, hotels have fully carpeted floors, and there's a couple of very good reasons for that. First of all, it's your safety. You're far less likely to slip and fall on a carpet than on a wooden or tiled floor. Secondly, it's much more cost-effective because it's faster and cheaper to replace a spoiled carpet than change the whole flooring in a room. And finally, Carpets add to the room's soundproofing, which you'll be thankful for if you have overly active neighbors. Ever wondered what a continental breakfast is and why it's called that? In fact, the name comes from the UK, which is a group of islands, and it means a breakfast that's served in continental Europe. It may include pastries, sliced bread with different toppings, meat, cheese, fruit juice, and hot beverages. You check into your hotel room, connect to Wi-Fi, jump on the bed, and post 15 photos of your new window view. When the initial surge of excitement is gone, you notice a suspicious blinking light on your big TV. Could it be that someone is watching you? Or have you just seen too many spy movies? Well, hidden cameras come in all shapes and sizes. Large ones are easy to spot, but the small ones can be really sneaky and inconspicuous. They can be hiding behind furniture, in decorations, or vents, and anywhere else you'll have trouble noticing. There are even special cameras that can be hidden in everyday movable objects, like alarm clocks, picture frames, vases, and lamps. Check to see if these objects are facing at a strange angle, or if they're positioned to get the best view of your room or bathroom. The easiest way to spot a hidden cam is to look for the lens reflection because all cameras come with lenses. Turn off the lights and slowly scan the room with a flashlight, laser pointer, or a special wireless spy cam detector. It comes with infrared scanning lights and one illuminating light. When you find a reflective red spot, you gotta turn on the flashlight to help check if there is a hidden camera. Definitely check the vents along with any other holes and gaps in the walls or ceiling. 
Some advanced detectors even show you what the camera is seeing, making it way easier to spot and disable. The detectors only work on cameras that are turned on and working normally, though. Your mobile phone can also help you find some hidden threats. Turn on Bluetooth and walk around. See if any unknown devices pop up on the screen. Another idea is to install a network scanner app that shows all devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi network you're using at the hotel. When it's done scanning, study the list for devices called something like IP camera or cam. Plus, you can put your phone on selfie mode, turn off the light and close the curtains, and look around the room slowly while focusing on the screen. Keep an eye out for purple or white lights on the screen. You can play detective some more and call your friend or family member and start walking around your room. Secret cameras should emit a sort of radio frequency. It will most likely interfere with your phone call signal. If you start hearing any weird noises while you're on the phone in a certain area of your room, make sure to inspect it carefully. Check out the light switches, electrical outlets, lamps, and other objects you normally wouldn't pay attention to. If they look a bit crooked, have a hole, or seem misplaced, it could be a sign that someone tampered with them. Many spy devices need wires, and whoever installed them had to hide those wires, often behind the vinyl baseboard. That's why the place where the floor and the wall meet is another area you should check. Ridges, bumps, or discoloration could be a sign there's a microphone hiding there. The same goes for spots on ceilings and walls even if they're not larger than a coin. If you do find a hidden camera or something looking suspicious, don't shy away and let the hotel administration or your booking service know about it. Don't try to touch or move the device yourself. If the hotel denies everything, contact local law enforcement. After you've scanned the room for cameras, check out the mirrors. Someone could be watching you from the other side. First, see if the mirror is built into the wall or can be adjusted. If the mirror is semi-transparent, it will be built into the wall. You can do a simple test to check the mirror. Press your fingertip against the glass and push firmly enough to leave a fingerprint as you move your finger away. Study the fingerprint. If there is a small gap between the print and the mirror where the glass should be, then it's just a mirror. On a semi-transparent mirror, there will be no gap. Another way to check if your mirror is semi-transparent is simply to tap the glass. If someone is watching you from the other side, the mirror will make an empty sound. A double mirror needs a brighter light on the other side than on yours. Get close to it and cup your hands around your eyes. Do you see some light behind the mirror? If so, you might have an unwanted audience. Before you leave your room or go to bed, make sure every door is securely locked. By every door, I mean not only the entrance to the room, but also the door leading to the terrace, if you have one. You can bring a portable door lock with you for extra security if you're staying in. You could also start a little DIY project and wrap a belt or a bag strap around the arm that pushes the door shut. Buckle it up and wrap it around several times for an extra layer of protection. Another idea for when you're about to nap or go to sleep is to build a pyramid of stuff by the door. Glasses and mugs will do perfectly. If someone tries to get inside while you're sleeping, there'll be some serious noise. Intruders prefer to keep it low-key, so they're highly likely to give up on robbing you straight away. If you travel with some valuables and don't feel comfortable leaving them around the room, you could put them in the safe inside your room. But because those safes use passcodes instead of physical locks, someone from the hotel has to know the master code to unlock it, just in case. So, you can bring your own safe with you instead. You can find the ones looking like books on Amazon, for example. They're made of strong metal and textured paper. They come with a combination lock and have enough room to fit your passports, cash, and jewelry. In case you have to leave your laptop in the room and want to make sure no one plugs in a USB drive to steal your data, here's what you can do. 
Leave a bottle of water or some other item next to the USB port. Measure the distance. Let's say it's one thumb length away. For someone to plug in their device in the laptop, they need to move the bottle. You can take it one step further and drop a pen parallel to the laptop under a certain angle. You can measure the angle with your smartwatch or phone using the Compass app. Again, if someone moves it, you'll know. Even something as simple as a please do not disturb sign can help you figure out if someone entered your room while you were away. Make it look like you left in a rush and the sign accidentally stuck between the door and the door frame. If you come back and the sign is hanging freely, then someone must have ignored it and tried to disturb you. In that case, you can contact reception and ask to send someone to enter the room with you to keep you safe. If you care about the cleanliness of your room as much as you do about your belongings and your personal safety, this one's for you. Hotel housekeeping workers normally have up to 20 rooms to take care of on an 8-hour shift. It means they'll have no more than 30 minutes for your room. It gives them enough time to make the bed, clean the floors in the room and the bathroom, empty the trash bins, and dust all surfaces. But they rarely have the time to take care of smaller objects like light switches, door and drawer handles, and remotes. And yes, these are exactly the objects you'll be in contact with the most. They can actually have more germs than the toilet. So if you want to be sure those germs won't land on your hands, bring enough antibacterial wipes to clean all those things before you touch them. Check around the corner, under the bed. Wait, what's that hiding over there? Hotels are supposed to be your home away from home, but do you know what secrets they're keeping? Here's what no staff member or manager would ever tell you. Some hotel owners are very superstitious of the number 13, or they know guests might be. Whatever the case, you may find room 13 or the entire 13th floor completely missing. In the Far East, the same can be said about the number 4. You can easily get an upgraded room without any additional charge if you have a birthday, anniversary, or wedding. Just call ahead of time and warn them about the upcoming event. You might be checking that bed for stains and bugs, but you're probably overlooking the dirtiest thing in the room, the TV remote. It doesn't get disinfected between guests. Put it in a plastic sandwich baggie before using it. Plenty of other filthy things in that room, but we'll touch on those later. Every hotel has a place where housekeeping stores forgotten things. The most frequently lost items are phone chargers, but more interesting discoveries have been found. False teeth, glass eyes, and even boxes of worms. If no one comes for these strange treasures after 5 or 10 years, yes, they're nice enough to wait. The cleaners raffle the lost items among themselves. Some luxury ones may have hidden cameras built in for safety reasons. The most common place for this is the door peepholes. So always put a piece of masking tape or putty over the one in your room. But hidden cameras in the room itself are never okay. To check the place, turn off the overhead light and switch on your phone's front-facing camera. Slowly scan the room. Your front camera will pick up their infrared light. Common spots are near the bed and in the bathroom, so check those areas thoroughly. Hotel owners often let their friends and family stay for free. You wouldn't know it since they usually leave before peak season starts. The employees and cleaners also get in on some perks. They keep towels, slippers, bathrobes, and shampoos. But what you might not know is that hotel chains are fine with you taking things from the room. Stationery, toiletries, coffee mugs, umbrellas, anything with their name and logo on it. This will serve as free advertisement when you take those things with you. Those beautiful, bright vegetables and fruits near the hotel restaurant's entrance aren't just a decoration. They trick your body into feeling full before you even get your plate. You eat less, and the company saves money. They may give you extra bottles of shower gel or other toiletries, but there are ones that charge you for grabbing too much food during the breakfast buffet. 
to avoid upsetting the cooks with the amount of discarded food, some hotels in certain countries make their guests pay for anything left uneaten on the plate. No hotel chain would willingly tell you how to get the biggest discount for your stay. So if you have a limited budget, make a reservation after 6 p.m. This is when the sales department tries to sell all canceled reservations at the last minute. That often means cutting the price down, sometimes in half. The first Sunday of the month is the best time to check in. Vacationers are leaving, business travelers haven't arrived yet, so most of the best rooms will be available. To get the top pick, use a special service called Rooming. You can view everything in the hotel and choose which room you like the most. Just ask the receptionist about it. They won't willingly speak up about other free services unless you ask. Free phone chargers, hair irons, bottled water, and board games are among them. They can also order a transfer for you, book concert or theater tickets, and wake you up at a specified time. Hotels can refuse you a check-in, even if you've paid for a booking in advance. They can cancel your reservation if you don't show up before 6 p.m. If something's holding you up on your way, call and let them know in advance. Even if you arrive on time, you can still be denied a room. It usually happens when the hotel is overbooked. In that case, they might redirect you to a different one. Even more surprising, the chances of this happening depend on who you are. Young single men, couples, and groups of friends will usually get the boot before a family or a single older woman. It's because the first group is usually more flexible about the unexpected move. Before you pounce on that minibar, better check to see if those drinks are sealed. Hotel workers say they've had cases where guests finished all the provided beverages and then filled the bottles up with tap water to avoid paying for them. Shh, you didn't hear it from me. Large chains often have their own special transport for meeting important guests or getting around town. Their own taxis are usually cheaper than city ones. So if you want to save some money, check the cost of their transport at the reception. But don't ask the receptionist to recommend where you should have a meal. The hotel clerk will point you to a local place that pays them for the recommendations, even if it's overpriced and tasteless there. Guests don't really pay for the room itself, but for the hotel's location. Proximity to the airport, the beach, downtown, and famous sites will cost you an additional amount. Yes, even if it doesn't have any stars at all and the conditions inside aren't great. Think twice before handing over your keys for valet parking. There have been cases when hotel workers took an expensive car for a joyride and even filmed it. My car? No. A famous person could be staying in the room right next to you. Nobody would know it since they get to use made-up names to conceal their identity. For the rest of us common folk, that's not allowed. You requested a single room with a big bed and a nice view of the beach. What you got? A room with two small beds and a lovely view of a brick wall. It happens all the time. But they're supposed to give you compensation or some free service to make up for the difference. Know your right to this if the manager doesn't offer. The safe in your room can be anything but safe. If you have some valuables, ask the receptionist to put them in the main hotel safe up front. This place is usually much more secure since all the staff doesn't have access to it. Although hotel chairs and sofas look clean, wait till you see one under a microscope. Don't sit on them without first laying down a towel or blanket. You don't know if the guests before you had their feet up on the furniture. And their feet would certainly be filthy, since the room's carpets are rarely shampooed, maybe once a year or even less. That being said, don't walk on them barefoot. If you use slippers or keep your shoes on, make sure to put shower caps on the bottoms when you pack them into your suitcase before leaving. Same story with that bed. Before you lie down on it, know that the cleaning staff might launder the linens between guests but not that big, beautiful, germy bedspread. Don't touch the drinking glasses either. Even if they get a wipe down, it was probably with the same cloth used to clean other surfaces. Why? 
Well, because staff have only 20 to 30 minutes to clean each room completely. So they need to do it quickly, not thoroughly. Things that often get overlooked? Light switches, door and drawer handles, remotes. Ironically enough, it's the things that get touched most often. Experts have found that these items have as much germs on them as the toilet. Solution? Always bring plenty of antibacterial wipes. And if you ask about the hotel's cleaning practices, remember, cleaning doesn't mean disinfecting. Choose your words wisely and don't give the manager a loophole. They're watching you when you're in the bedroom and when you're in the bathroom. No, I'm not talking about your three-year-old kids. Mm -mm. One of the last things you think about when going on vacation is if the room you're staying in has hidden cameras planted all over the place. For starters, look in the most obvious spots in your hotel room to see if you can find any hidden cameras. According to some experts, if you can't find anything in plain sight, then using your smartphone is enough for a basic sweep. Every camera has a lens, and all lenses reflect light. So a quick way to check for hidden cameras is to close all the curtains in the room and turn off the lights. Use your phone's flashlight to point it at potential places or objects a hidden camera might be at. One of the apparent spots is the smoke detector on the ceiling. Grab a chair and point the light straight at it and try to see if there's any red or blue light reflected. You'll have to do it slowly since the light needs to strike the lens at the correct angle for you to see a reflection. After you're done, move on to other objects like the shower head in the bathroom or an alarm clock or phone charger. Keep in mind the positions of these objects. If the charger is placed where a surveillance camera could be, then investigate it and call the reception. Even a painting in the room can be a potential nest for a hidden camera. Other objects can be lamps, a hole in the wall, or somewhere inside the closet. Another creepy place is the bathroom mirror. This one is tricky to spot, so you'll have to be patient when inspecting it. You can also use your phone camera to spot surveillance cameras that spy on you at night. These secret cameras emit infrared lights that the human eye can't see so that they can work at night. You'll also have to turn off all the lights and put the camera in selfie mode. The rear-facing camera on most smartphones has an infrared filter, but the front one doesn't. You can try pointing a TV remote at the front-facing camera and press on any of the buttons to see it yourself. If you see a bright red light on your screen, that means it's working. All you have to do is move your camera in the dark to see if you can find a bright light around. It'll be good to do a second sweep to make sure you didn't miss anything. Another technique you can use is turning off the Wi-Fi when you enter the hotel room. Most of the cameras are hooked up to the Wi-Fi, so they won't be functioning anymore. If you get a call from the reception saying that the Wi-Fi is down in the room, that might be a red flag. There's no reason for them to know if the Wi-Fi was purposely turned off. It could mean that the cameras are on the local Wi-Fi. When you connect to your hotel room Wi-Fi for the first time, be careful about sharing your personal data. Most networks will ask for your login credentials, such as your email. Some people can recreate a Wi-Fi login page that's identical to that of the actual hotel, which can be deceiving. You might be connecting to a Wi-Fi router, but an email is all it takes for some people to know everything about you. One of the best things you can do is download an app that shows you what devices are currently connected to the Wi-Fi that you're using. It can show what smartphone, laptop, smart TV, and in the worst case, hidden cameras are connected. A radio frequency scanner can detect a wireless camera in the room, even if it's connected to its own Wi-Fi. It might be challenging, though, because of many wireless devices overcrowding the airways. You can pick up random signals even if you turn off all your devices and any wireless emitting signals. Intrusion into your personal life can go so far as someone tapping your mobile phone or landline to listen to your conversations. One way of eavesdropping on people's conversations is installing a microphone to a line that sends the audio wirelessly to a recorder from a remote transmitter. Almost anyone can get their hands on such equipment since it's not too expensive to buy and is available in many shops and online. If you notice strange sounds while talking on the phone, like clicking, distant voices, or that sound similar to an old record playing, then chances are someone is listening to your phone calls. These sounds aren't typical for a regular modern cell phone. Most bugging software runs in the background of your phone without you knowing, which drains the battery. 
There can be many explanations for why your phone battery keeps draining, but some software living on your phone, viruses, and malware will likely be the reason. You can also look out for unusual phone activity when you're not using your gadget. If your notifications keep popping up and you muted them, then maybe your phone is being bugged. In that case, they do not only have access to your phone calls, but your actual phone. They can fish out any picture, video, file, and information you have without you knowing it. If you try powering off your phone and it takes way longer than usual, it can be another sign of someone tracking your phone. For the phone to completely shut down, it needs to log out of all the tasks and activities properly. If your phone is transferring data to someone remotely, it might be the reason for the delay in shutting down. One of the biggest red flags is if you receive text messages that have random symbols and numbers. The ones who tap your phone use some illegal software, which sometimes requires them to receive secret codes. Make sure the text messages aren't something you subscribe to. Otherwise, contact someone who can help. If you scroll through your apps and notice something that shouldn't be there, or something that looks fishy, the app could be a disguise for a spying app. Also, check for weird history in your browsers for stuff you didn't search. You might notice your phone turning on and off randomly without you touching your phone. And worst of all, they can turn on your phone camera anytime they want without you knowing. If you feel like your phone is tampered with, then you have to factory reset everything. It wipes out all the data, including files, settings, and apps. The same risks apply to your laptop. Every now and then, we all click on something that seems legit, even though it acts as an access point for spyware to enter our computer software. Draining battery, overheating, and weird activity are telltale signs of your PC being infected. GPS trackers are the most common ways to track someone's vehicle. It's pretty simple to get the job done, but it's very difficult to find the trackers since they're usually planted deep inside the car. If you ever get the spooky feeling that someone could be watching you while you drive or, coincidentally, see the same person everywhere you drive your car, then start searching for that tracker. The most common places are underneath the car or near the back wheels. But the person tracking your car is smart and knows what they're doing. They're not going to let you find it that easily. If you find nothing on the outside of your vehicle, then try looking on the inside. If you find something there, it's a clear sign the person tracking you broke into your car and planted the tracking device. Or it could be someone you know who took a ride with you once and slipped it in without you knowing. Check behind the dashboard and within your car's electronics to be sure. Instead of ripping your car apart to find the tracker, you can buy a GPS bug detector. They work by finding electronic frequencies in your car's proximity. They won't block it from tracking you down, but they'll help you find it. Before using it, turn off your smartphone or put it in airplane mode. This way, the frequencies won't intercept with the tracking device. And if you feel like this isn't working, try parking your car in a remote area where nothing is in sight. Even a remote garage would do. Well, anyone else feeling a little paranoid? Let's see some hands. You pull up to a hotel and see a no vacancy sign, but don't necessarily believe it. Hotels usually do this when they only have two or three rooms left. Instead, try calling the front desk to see if they have rooms. Hotel star ratings aren't always reliable, as the rating systems vary between countries. In Italy, for example, a hotel can be given five stars just for having a 24-hour reception desk receptionists that speak three languages, and rooms that start at 16 square meters. Instead of using stars, look at ratings or reviews instead. Booking late can also get you the best deals. If your stay is not urgent, try booking a room on the day of the stay. If the hotel isn't full, you'll likely get a discount. Hotel managers reduce room rates last minute to fill them. It's also usually better to book directly with the hotel. Third-party websites are often given worse rooms or whatever is left over. Hotels are also likely to offer a reduced rate if you book directly. This is because third-party sites charge the hotel a fee. Once you're at the check-in desk, it's likely that the hotel staff already recognize you. Many hotels, especially higher-end ones, will do a little research on their guests' social media. While this seems a bit creepy, it's only so they can see who you are to make your stay more comfortable. 
At check-in, you'll also be given an initial key which will reset the door lock and cancel any existing keys. But make sure to be respectful to your receptionist. Sometimes they might play practical jokes on rude customers by key bombing. This is where they give you two of the initial keys. Either key resets the door, so once you use the second one, the first will no longer work. If your key has a magnetic strip on it, make sure not to put it near your cell phone or wallet. A strong magnet like the one in your phone can erase your card key, meaning you won't be able to get into your room. Now that you're all checked in, let's head up to your room. Make sure to have a quick scan of your doors and floor. Some hotel guests have reported tiny cameras being slipped underneath their doors. Even if the door is locked, endoscope cameras can easily slide under. The general rule is, if you can fit your finger under the door, a camera can fit too. Try covering the gap with a towel. Now, how about the room in general? If you're not happy with it, you can easily request a change. If there are other available rooms, the manager will be happy to help. Once you are settled in, you'll want to head into the bathroom to check out all those samples. But while you might think you're being sneaky by grabbing the free shampoos, hotels actually want you to take them. The items contain the hotel's logo, so you're basically giving them free (laughs) advertising if you put them in your home. The robes and towels are a different story, though. Many hotels are now adding radio frequency chips so they can track stolen items. Toothpaste is one item you probably won't find in the hotel room's bathroom. For budget hotels, it's often too expensive to order as it's classified as a medical supply. For luxury hotels, it's the opposite. They often can't find a toothpaste manufacturer that's fancy enough to be present in their rooms. You may also notice a seemingly random phone next to the toilet. But it's actually a requirement from the AAA for hotels to receive a four-diamond rating. It does also act as a safety feature. If you slip on the wet floor or get stuck in the bathroom for some reason, you can easily call for help. While the staff clean hotel rooms frequently, disinfecting smaller ones is not on the top of their priority list. Remote controls and phones are some of the dirtiest things in a hotel room. So do yourself a favor and bring some disinfectant wipes to clean them before use. If you're thinking about putting your valuables in the safe for security, you also might want to think twice. Hotel locks use passcodes instead of locks, so there's a high chance someone in the hotel will know the master code. And who knows who else could get their hands on this information. You may also want to throw that comforter on the floor, too. While sheets may be cleaned regularly, the comforters are not. Some hotels wash them every week or so, but others don't even bother. Ew. The same, I fear, goes for your sheets. Most high-end hotels will change the sheets daily, but a lot of budget ones don't change the pillows or bedding after a guest checks out. Definitely a good idea to request fresh pillowcases when you arrive. Now you're ready to kick back on the bed and rent a movie. But don't try to be sneaky and claim you clicked on it by accident so you don't have to pay. The workers at the hotel's front desk can actually see how long you watched a movie for. So if you clicked out after a few seconds, they'll believe you, but not if you watched it till the end. Fancy a drink while you watch your movie? Make sure to check the seals on those minibar drinks. Sneaky guests often drink from the bottles and refill them with water. This way, they waive the fee, and you may be charged if housekeeping hasn't noticed. After a good night's sleep, you're looking for something to do on your vacation. Instead of heading to Google or TripAdvisor to find the best spots, ask the front desk. Receptionists are trained to give guests the best recommendations for local activities. While you're out, housekeeping will drop by your room, but they might not just be cleaning. Sometimes, if a staff member is tired and they have enough time, they might take a cheeky nap on the bed. When cleaning, if you've left your room in a mess, the staff will have to move your things. They'll have to touch your stuff to actually clean. So if this bothers you, either put out the Do Not Disturb sign or clean up yourself. It's also best not to drink out of that glass in the bathroom, as many glasses aren't cleaned properly. Some workers even use disinfectant or furniture polish to get the glasses looking spotless. Housekeeping also don't always vacuum your room. Staff will sometimes just pick up any big crumbs and call it a day. Make sure to be nice to the staff. Most hotel staff are willing to give out upgrades and free stuff to a friendly face. They're not required to, but a smile goes a long way. Oh, and a tip always helps. 
Now it's time for checkout, but you're leaving early and will miss your breakfast. If your breakfast is included in the price of your room, the staff can prepare a takeout box for you. It's best to give them a heads up the night before, though. Also, take a look at the floor on your way out. It's carpet, right? Most hotels have fully carpeted floors. This is for three main reasons. One, you're much less likely to slip on carpet than wood or stone. Two, carpets act as added soundproofing. And three, it's more cost-effective for the hotel, as carpet is much easier and cheaper to replace. You're all prepared for your next vacation, but you get called into work last minute. Oh, a nightmare! Everything's booked, so it looks like you'll be charged that pesky last-minute cancellation fee. If you call the hotel and ask to change to a later booking date, there's a chance that when you cancel this new date, the charge will be lifted. Hotels also usually overbook themselves, as the average daily no-show rate is around 10%. This means there's a chance you won't actually get your reserved room. If you show up and there's no available rooms, chances are you'll get walked. This basically means the hotel will pay for a room at another similar hotel in the area. Most hotels also only accept credit cards as a form of payment. While it may be annoying, this is to ensure that they get their payment. Guests often use extra paid services, like the minibar, which they pay for at checkout. If your debit card doesn't have enough funds to cover the cost, the only way for the hotel to get the money is to sue you. Attorneys come for a separate fee. There's a surprising amount of items left in rooms that hotels don't want you to know about. In one hotel in Portugal, a worker even found a shark that was left behind. With no idea how it ended up there, the shark was eventually returned to its natural habitat safe and sound. Once again, be careful when you first go into the bathroom. Did you know that every 15 seconds, a home burglary occurs in the United States? This means that approximately 4,800 burglaries happen every day. And the police can only solve 13% of all the reported cases. So yeah, home security is nothing to be joked about, and so I won't. But still, don't worry. It's not like you need to turn your house into a fortress to feel safe. There are a great number of things you can do to keep the bad people out of your house and keep your valuables safe without breaking the bank. First things first. Homes without a security system are 300% more likely to be broken into and burglarized. So you should definitely consider setting up one. However, there are many different types of security systems out there. That's why it can get overwhelming to choose the best one for your specific needs, desired level of protection, and budget. Yet again, it all comes down to two options. Professional installations and DIY installations. Let's go through both of them together. Professional installed systems require professional monitoring and usually have contracts that are likely long-term. Professional systems come with fees. However, companies usually require lower upfront equipment costs since they will spread the cost throughout the course of your contract. Once you decide on a professional installation, the company will first schedule an appointment with one of their experienced technicians who can conduct a security assessment and explain all your options to you. And as long as your contract is valid, you can report any problems you have with the system to them so they can make sure the equipment works correctly. All in all, you should pick professionally installed security systems if you want to put up your feet and relax instead of watching long hours of tutorial videos or reading pages of manuals. Still, professionally installed security systems may not work for you, especially if you're a renter due to the contract commitment conditions. Or maybe you're not a renter, but you simply have budget limitations. That's where DIY installations come in handy. The greatest thing about DIY systems is that while the average monitoring price is around $50 per month on professionally installed systems, it is around $28 a month on DIY ones. Plus, there are no installation fees with DIY systems either. Yet again, you should expect higher upfront equipment costs if you're going to pick this option. And there's also the fact that DIY home security systems come with the risks of improper equipment placement and missing security vulnerabilities a pro would catch. At the end of the day, the most important thing you need to do before choosing a system is evaluate the needs of your neighborhood as well as your house. Did you know that 34% of burglars simply use the front door when breaking into a home? 
That means if your door is not strong and secure enough, you're basically inviting the burglars in. So setting up security systems is not enough. You need to inspect all your exterior doors, too. Make sure the door frames are strong and the hinges are protected. You can always use door reinforcement kits to add extra protection. If your door has a mail slot, don't forget to check if it's possible for someone to reach through it to unlock the door. When moving into a house or an apartment that was previously occupied by someone else, change the door locks. This is the easiest way to ensure that no stranger can just walk into your house using the keys. One other way to boost security for your door is to use wireless doorbell cameras. This one from Amazon is extremely user-friendly. It's 100% wireless, it has a built-in rechargeable battery that can last 1-2 to two months, so you won't have to charge those too often. You can track the battery situation from the phone app. It also has motion detection technology and super night vision. And you don't need to worry about the weather conditions because it's also waterproof. By the way, don't forget about the sliding glass doors. You can use a window bar or dowel in the track to keep them from being forced open. Or you can add a door sensor or glass break sensor to get alerted if and when someone is tampering with them. We're getting into the very basics of home security now. The percentage of burglars entering a home through a window is as high as 23%. The main reason for that is because, most of the time, people forget to lock their windows. Yet again, burglars can always break the glass. If you don't want that to happen, you can try reinforcing the glass with window security film, adding window bars, or installing window sensors. If none of that is possible, you can also plant prickly bushes under the first floor windows to discourage burglars from choosing your house to break in. Now, what's the difference between an actor and a burglar? Burglars don't like to be in the spotlight. <laughs> That's why having outdoor lighting is to your advantage. Lights should be placed around your front and backyards, along pathways, and near the garage. To make your outdoor security lights more effective, you can use motion-activated ones. Take this one for example, it's solar-powered, so it'll help you save energy. But that doesn't mean you won't have any light once the clouds cover the sky. It's able to run 4-5 to five nights on rainy days. Also, don't allow the burglars to play hide-and-seek. While trees and shrubs may make your home look more beautiful, they also provide a convenient hiding spot for burglars. That's why you should trim down trees and plants, at least the ones close to your house that could be used for cover. Choose smaller flowers and bushes instead, so that burglars don't have a hiding spot to wait for you to leave your home. The same thing goes for any lock gates, sheds, or other outdoor buildings you have. Make sure those places are locked. Burglars can use stools and ladders to climb in from the windows, too. So don't tempt them by leaving one outside. Now this one goes without saying, but I will anyway. Lock the garage. Even if there's no access to your home through there, it's likely that you still have plenty of valuable stuff stored in there that burglars might be interested in. It's also wise to store your garage door opener inside your house rather than leave it in your car. This way, you'll be preventing burglars from easily taking it. If you use a security code to open your garage, then keep it confidential and avoid entering it in front of other people, including neighbors. Some neighbors, well, you just don't know. Installing a driveway alarm will also help secure the garage. Now These days, not just burglars, but porch pirates, aka package thieves, are a big problem too. Last year, almost 1 in 7 Americans fell victim to them. This is where security cameras proved to be useful. First of all, they work as a deterrent. And secondly, if someone were to really steal your package, you'd be able to identify them thanks to the security footage. If you can't spare some money to get a good security camera for the time being, you can opt for a fake one. They're a lot cheaper, and they will help make your home look more secure than it actually is. This one is worth considering if you're searching the market. It contains a flashing light, which makes it look as realistic as it gets. Now, last but not least, having a safe wouldn't hurt. And don't worry, it doesn't have to be one of those uncrackable giant titanium ones in the heist movies, like Ocean's 23. Burglars may still be able to break into your house despite all the precautions. So you still need to make sure your valuables are protected at all times. 
You can hide all things important from your expensive jewelry to your vital documents in there just to be extra safe. If you're going to get yourself one, make sure it is fire-resistant, waterproof, and heavy enough that a thief can't pick it up and walk away with it. As they say, better safe than sorry. Did you know that most break-ins take place in the middle of the day? The FBI says burglaries happen midday because people are outside the house. Don't let your home be an easy mark for theft. Here are 10 tips to protect your home and some security items you might need along the way. Number one on our list is portable door locks. They aren't just designed for regular houses. Let's say you stay in a rented house where other guests also come and go. You can carry one of these portable locks with you. Many rooms have secondary locking mechanisms besides the regular lock, like security chains attached to the door, but you shouldn't always rely on them. These mechanisms are only held by screws. It means they're easy to dislocate. There are many portable lock models, so what should you look for? Ease of use is the key for installation and removal in case of emergency. Most inward swing doors are suitable for these items. Adalock is a good example. You can find it on Amazon. It's fairly inexpensive, has a versatile design, and most importantly, comes in one piece. It takes seconds to upgrade your safety. You insert the claws into the door strike plate and then close the door. It'll be held in position with a handle. There you go. Burglars don't hang out in your house or bother stealing heavy stuff like TVs. They want to get in and out in under 10 minutes. What you should do is take some precautions to slow them down. Laminated glass is great for this. You should consider investing in it. Normal windows that are made with tempered glass can shatter easily, but laminated windows are like shields. They can crack but not break apart. Instead of making smashing noises and grabbing attention, the burglar will probably leave. The structure of laminated glass is different from the regular one. It holds the piece intact even after a strong impact. Laminated glass windows are 100 times stiffer and 5 times more durable than standard. What makes these types of glass so special? Firstly, it's made with layers. There are two layers of glass, and there's a vinyl material in between that helps keep the two layers intact. As a bonus, laminated ones have a soundproofing feature. Two birds with one stone. The interlayer absorbs some of the outside noise. It's glass after all. Aren't we going to see the vinyl layer? That might be the question that popped into your head. Nope, laminated glass is transparent, just like other types. Enjoy the crystal clear views while staying safe. I would say, but unfortunately, it's expensive to get these specifically manufactured burglar deterring glasses. You can have professionals install a laminate film onto your standard windows, or you can even buy security film. They all work according to the same principle. But obviously, these alternatives cannot be as strong as the laminated glass itself. The next few tips come from an ex-burglar, Michael Fraser. Now he's giving bits of advice on how to protect from theft. His first tip is quite interesting. Don't put a beware of the dog sticker if you have a dog. If a dog can walk around the house without triggering the alarm, so can a human. This is the way burglars think. Plus, many dogs get friendly in a short time unless they're specifically trained to catch strangers. Otherwise, they can easily be put in a room and, well, you know the rest. Bye-bye to precious items. Advertising your house for sale online is a standard procedure to attract potential buyers, but also thieves. With your innocent picks, burglars can have floor plans with virtual tours. They can easily spot the entry and escape routes. Sounds like a perfect plan to rob a house. Number five is buying a home security system. It helps prevent thefts and notifies you if that happens. According to the data, homes without a security system are almost three times more vulnerable to break-ins. There are numerous ones to choose from. 
Some are pricey, but luckily, there are affordable options too. You don't even have to call professionals. This do-it-yourself security system from Amazon is an example of a budget-friendly gadget with useful features. These types of devices are designed to be easy to install. You'll be guided through an app for the software and for the product itself. Bonus, you won't have to deal with screws, tools, or drilling. They have fast emergency dispatch that can notify the authorities if you say so. Since it's easy to set up, it's perfect for short-term residents too. Remember I mentioned that if a dog can walk in the house, so can a thief? Well, technology is not in favor of thieves. These types of devices can now detect intruders and be friends with your pet. The sensors can be put in the window, doors, and corners, but still be adjusted to avoid fake alarms by the pets. Another device to add a layer of protection to you, especially in shared residences like dorms, is a doorstop alarm. These devices are very compact, so you can put them in your luggage and take them on your dream vacation. You can use it in your daily life. A doorstop alarm can be used on any door as long as you place it inside. It works as a door wedge, but it keeps the door closed. How does it work? When the alarm is triggered, it will keep the intruder outside the door and activate a noise alarm. It can wake the owner of the house or neighbors. This one, again, can be easily found on Amazon. Ex-Burglar Michael also recommends thinking like a thief. Ask yourself, how would I get in? It's a great starting exercise for discovering vulnerable spots. Walk around your home. Is there a window that can be easily opened? Oh wait, is it your laptop on the desk that can be seen from the street? Speaking of the street, if you buy a new electronic device like a TV or a computer, don't leave the empty cartons displayed near the trash container. This looks like an invitation to thieves. They will know that you have expensive electronics inside the house. Instead, break down the cardboard boxes and then put them away for recycling. Unfortunately, first floor windows are entry points in 23% of home break-ins. To prevent this, you can purchase a wireless alarm kit. When it comes to the front door, installing a double key deadbolt can be a solution. Similarly, motion sensor lighting does the job. Do you have blind spots around your home? Upgrade to a security camera with night vision. If you want to see what's happening inside your house rather than outside, you can get one of these cool security gadgets. Orbi Robotic Mobile Sphere is like a ball, but it has a camera inserted in it. It doesn't have a limited view. Imagine you're at the office and want to play with your dog. Your four-pod best friend can chase the ball at home while you're away controlling the device. Ah, okay, we're here to save your house from burglars, so I'll leave fun pet toys for another video. Here is a shocking truth about fences. Most people believe that fences are like guardians protecting their property. Sorry to break it to you, but even tall and solid ones aren't as secure as you believe. The number one rule of a thief is not to be caught. And if they broke into a house with fences at night, they'd be perfectly covered. Your neighbors can't see who that person is. You know, unless they have x-ray vision. The fences should be hard to climb. One of the points of having a fence is privacy. But I'm just saying metal, wire, and picket fences are harder for intruders to fly in. So, we cracked the burglar's code. Implementing the tips on our list might help you discourage and prevent burglary and keep you safe. Did you experience such unpleasant incidents? If so, do you have any other tips for fellow brightsiders to watch out for? Oops, another burglary in the US has just occurred. Wait another 22.6 seconds and there will be another one. Hey, no need to worry about your property. Forewarned, forearmed. Let's explore a few tips on how to protect your house. A mere sticker can contribute a lot to your house's safety. For instance, you can use a sticker that says you have a home security system, even if in reality you don't. It may not sound convincing enough, but still, burglars prefer not to mess with such houses. Just one more tip here, make sure the sticker looks true to life, so a makeshift sign won't do. It's better to fork out some money and grab a real looking sticker. Another smart trick is to leave a pair of really large shoes on the porch so that the burglars 
could clearly see them. It will make them think someone big and dangerous lives there, and they won't fancy meeting them. Right, now let's inspect your door. I hope you don't leave the keys under the doormat. The only things you can leave under the mat are the cookies or chips. This is a fun way to see if someone was visiting you while you were away. However, the trick doesn't give you a 100% guarantee. It might be a mailman, a delivery guy who got the wrong door, or even a random dog hanging around your porch. Yeah, cookies feel better in your stomach, not under the doormat. Okay, you're back home from work. It was a tough day and you're tired. You leave the keys in the keyhole and completely forget about it. Right, the main thing is that you've locked the door and the keys are inside. But who said there is no burglar in the bushes targeting your house? Technically, it might be impossible to insert a dupe and get in if there's a key in the keyhole. But these guys are well equipped and have a whole assortment of hooks to lure the key out. You know what happens next? They can seep into your house as silently as ninjas and grab all your valuables while you're peacefully sleeping. A lock that can only be closed from the inside and can't be opened from the outside seems like a good solution. When moving to a new place, even if you didn't buy it but rent it, make sure to change the locks. Who knows how many copies of those keys there are? As for renting, you never know who lived there before you moved in. Also, if for some reason you accidentally left your keys in the front door for some time, the best thing to do is to change the lock. Yeah, probably nothing bad will happen, but still, it's better to play it safe. Plus, not only should you stop leaving the keys in the door, but you also shouldn't leave them on display. Maybe it's better to bring the keys to the living room instead of keeping them near the front door. Sometimes, burglars can use not only your door, but your window too. Mind your trash, especially if you throw away some pricey stuff packaging. Don't let the thieves know what you purchased and how much you paid for it. Also, your trash may contain some essential information about your personal data, credit card details, and so much more. Keep an eye on your mailbox. Make sure you have a lock on it. Thing is, burglars may be quite interested in your mail contents, so the secret is simple. Keep the mailbox locked and make sure you shred any personal data related papers. Now let's inspect your front lawn. Hey, I can see something compromising. I'm talking about these large bushes. Yeah, I know you don't have time to trim them. The larger they get, the more space there is for the burglars to hide. Plus, if someone sees untrimmed shrubs and trees in the front yard, they might think nobody's home. You see the point, right? Okay, let's say you ignored all the previous tips and burglars broke into your house. The most interesting thing for them is surely cash. If you don't have any cash at home, you can skip this tip. But if you have valuables, get creative. Cash can be stuffed into a plastic bag and hidden in a large container with some leftovers. Also, you can place that plastic bag into an old detergent bottle you keep in the storeroom or the kitchen. Burglars aren't likely to look for your stash there. A couple of don'ts here. Hiding cash or jewels in a prescription pills container isn't that smart. And yeah, a freezer isn't the best option either. Many burglars like to check it in the first place. Time to see if you keep your keys right. If you keep your car and house keys together, you might want to reconsider it. First off, imagine you lose them and burglars somehow know where you live. Not only will they grab what they want, but they'll also have a vehicle to transport all your hard-earned belongings. Keep an eye on your garage keys, especially if it's possible to sneak into your house through your garage. Even if it isn't, who said there are no valuables in the garage? However, there are no limits whatsoever for burglars. They can sneak into houses even through small windows. The reason why they prefer doors is that it's the safest way while squeezing through the window can get scratches, and it's not that they don't want to spoil their looks. The thing is, if they leave their DNA, they can be traced. However, crooks are careful about not leaving their traces. For instance, a report from England claims only about 3% of burglars leave forensic evidence. To protect yourself at night, 
there are several options. Number one, insert a large paper clip or a bobby pin inside the keyhole. You can use a spare pair of keys if you have them. This way, you'll make it extremely hard, if not impossible, for the burglars to use the key dupes. Number two, barricading is an option. It can be a heavy chair, a bookshelf, you name it. I mean, why not if it makes you feel safe? If your door opens outwardly, a jammer could do a great job for you. A chair can be super handy. Secure it under the doorknob. It's not the most powerful security system, but at least it does its job. Binding the doorknobs or handles together can be an option too. A dummy security camera can protect you during the day and night. Again, burglars are not as fearless as they may seem. If you have a real CCTV, make sure the crooks don't deactivate it. So place it in some hard to get place. If you're ready to fork out some money for protection, then the motion sensor light is exactly what you need. Crooks like dim spots, and once they approach your place, they'll be frightened off by the bright light. This solution works as long as the burglars know you're home. In case they're sure you're away, it's way less efficient. TV and radio timers are another trick. With their help, you can imitate your home even if you're not. A perfect match for the motion sensor light. This trick can help outsmart some burglars, but again, it doesn't give a 100% guarantee. Some of them aren't afraid to break in, even if the TV's on. What about live alarm systems? This can be real or fake too. I'm talking about dogs. Remember the trick with the boots? You can do the same with a dog if you don't have one. Leave a large bowl on the porch, but make sure it all looks real. I mean, the bowl should not look untouched and brand new. Hey, do you know all your neighbors? If not, it's high time you baked some cookies and visited them to know them better. First, the crooks don't really like to operate in areas where few people know each other and care for each other. This way, their chances of being spotted and reported are extremely high. So, a sort of neighborhood watch is a perfect way to protect your house. And who knows? Find new friends. A slice of cheese isn't something you'd expect to find on your parked car. As hilarious as it seems, it might indicate something quite dangerous. One woman detailed such a story online. At first, she thought she had been pranked by some neighborhood kid. She decided to call a friend and ask for help with cleaning the car. But once the two ladies started removing the melted cheese, they noticed something strange two parking spots down from them. They remembered seeing a white van arriving. In it, there was a bunch of men staring at them. Since she wasn't alone, the woman decided to finish cleaning the car, even though the ladies didn't feel comfortable being watched. It took them almost an hour to scrape off the cheese that had already been melted under the heat of the sun. She did wonder, though, if this wasn't a tactic to rob a person, because most people would be so focused on cleaning up the mess on their car that they would be too distracted to keep an eye on their belongings. Or worse, what if it was a kidnapping strategy, since you wouldn't be able to see suspicious people coming at you in due course? She went on to recommend, if you ever see a piece of cheese on your car, just leave it. Your safest bet is to scrub it off at home, or to take your vehicle to the nearest car wash. They'll know the best way to remove it, without ruining the paint. The slice of cheese may have easily been a coincidence, but some scams out there are even more imaginative. If you notice a piece of clothing on your windshield or wrapped between your wiper blades, don't hurry to take it away. Again, it can be strategically placed there to distract you while your car gets taken away. The best option is to drive away as quickly as possible and get to a safe location. It should be well lit and populated. Then you can safely remove the objects placed on your car. Some people have even found money under their wipers. It was probably placed there with the same intent in mind. Here's a method some people swear by when it comes to decreasing the odds of getting your car snatched away. Keep the tires turned toward the curb when parked. That's because when your car wheels are positioned like that, thieves are less likely to be able to maneuver the vehicle. This way, your car will require more time and energy to be moved, and it will less likely become the focus of theft. Another woman remembered finding a napkin under her car door handle at one point, but at that time, she didn't think much of it. She removed it and went on with her day. However, a couple of hours later, she ended up in a hospital, complaining about pain in her hand and shortness of breath. 
doctors figured out she had been poisoned with an unknown substance. Unfortunately, scams are becoming more and more common these days, with online ones topping the list. You may be the subject of a phishing scam, for example, when you receive an email from someone who seems familiar. It might be your accountant, someone from work, or a retailer you often buy from. But if you look closely at the email address, you'll easily notice that something is off. It might just be one edited letter or a name spelled differently. These types of emails can ask various things from you. Anything from private information, such as addresses and passwords, to payment requests. Others offer coupons or gift cards. If you click on a certain website, it may actually hack your computer. This is probably the most common online scam these days. Authorities claim that over 114,700 people fell victim to it in 2019. Their losses were estimated at roughly $57.8 million. Then there are fake shopping websites. To make sure you're always on the right one, check the URL carefully. If the website reads Amazon.com with a zero, you're obviously not in the right place, and you're probably about to get scammed. You can buy something from these websites, but the chances are you'll be receiving nothing, or the best case scenario, a fake item. Ever heard of form jacking? It happens when a retailer gets hacked, and once you've finished adding things to your cart during a shopping session, you're actually redirected to a fraudulent payment page. The scammer then has access to your payment information, like your name, address, and credit card details. To always be on the safe side, double check the URL of the payment page before entering any sensitive information. Tech support scams are even more creative. With this one, you might even receive a phone call saying that your computer is infected with a dangerous virus, which may damage your device or destroy all the information stored on it. The scammer may then ask you to download an application that will give them access to your computer, even if they're located on the other side of the world. Then they'll download an actual virus on the computer to confirm their lie. It makes people think there's indeed something wrong with the computer. The next and final step, asking for a fee to fix it. If you suspect your device might be compromised, always reach out to a trusted tech support or retailer. These types of businesses will never contact you out of the blue. This scam tends to appeal to people's emotions, targeting mostly the older generation. That's why it's also dubbed the grandparent scam. The targeted senior will most likely receive a phone call from a distressed person, claiming they're a grandchild or a close relative. The fraudster will then proceed to ask for money for various things, like to get out of jail, to be able to leave a foreign country, or to cover a hospital bill. Grandparent scams are really on the rise these days. In 2017, the losses from such scams added up to $26 million, but in 2018, they almost doubled, reaching $41 million. If you find yourself in a similar situation, try not to act immediately. Ask the person for some information that could help you verify their identity. Also, it might be a good idea to double check with another family member before sending money to a stranger. The Google Voice scam is as easy as it is efficient. For scammers, of course. Here's what you should look out for. You might have posted your phone number on some website for various reasons. Maybe you're looking to sell something or offering to perform a service. The fraudsters will pick up on this information and rapidly call you, asking to verify if you aren't a scammer yourself. Talk about reverse psychology. You'll be asked to pass on a Google verification code. In reality, a Google Voice account is being set up in your name. Fraudsters can go on with their scams and pretend to be you while doing it. Using the newly created account. Rule number one, never share verification codes with anyone. Online resumes aren't safe either, as they can offer personal information to scammers. They will try to contact you, pretending to be recruiters. Some might even take the time to conduct a job interview. Most of them pretend to offer high-paying positions, which you'll obviously be inclined to accept. But here's the catch. Before they can offer you the documents for employment, you'll be asked for money for some participation fee, or even for your future home office setup. To make sure you're always on the safe side, create a different email address, which you'll only use for job hunting. This way, you can keep your personal email unlisted and safe from any unwanted online scams. Always ask recruiters to confirm the information you've heard on the phone via email too. If it's a company you're familiar with, you can also reach out to their HR department to confirm that what you're asked to do is according to their policy. 
Well, watch out in Arizona. Make sure you don't have a sleeping donkey in your bathtub anytime after 7 p.m. This is a law made in 1924, after an incident that occurred during a flood. One merchant wasn't allowed his donkey to sleep in his bathtub. This was before they weren't attached to the floor and could easily be moved. When the town flooded on a fateful night, the sleeping donkey was carried away by the torrent. It sailed through the town and ended up in a valley one mile away. The donkey was stranded in the tub, floating helplessly. The town gathered and eventually saved the poor guy. But it took a lot of effort and resources during the rescue. They quickly made a new decree there will be no more donkeys sleeping in bathtubs. So there. Now in Samoa, if a husband forgets his wife's birthday, he can be reported to the authorities by his partner. After the first incident occurs, a formal warning is issued. It would not be expected that he would set enough reminders for the following year not to forget. But if he does disregard the date again, he must go through a series of intense interviews to determine why he could forget such an important date. Depending on the defense of his forgetfulness, he can even face serious consequences. Just wait till he gets home. Alright, going back to Arizona. Here, you need a special permit if you want a saguaro cactus removed from your property. Taking it away without authorization could find you behind bars for up to 3 years. These cacti can live up to 200 years, and the reason why such strict conservation efforts are in place is that it can only produce seeds at the age of 35. Ah, you find yourself along a beautiful beach in Italy, along the coastal town of Eraclea. And of course, you've brought a bucket. Just don't make any sandcastles with it. They've been declared a dangerous trip hazard along the beach. So on this beach, leave your bucket at home. Otherwise, you could face paying a fine of up to 250 bucks. When you're driving along the road or hiking through the woods in the USA, you might see a strange purple mark painted on a fence, pole, or even a tree. Throughout several states, these markers are advising not to trespass on private property. They're using the paint instead of the normal warning signs, as it's a cheaper alternative that lasts longer. It's been implemented at different times over the past decade in 15 states, and it's expected to continue to spread to others. So be sure to keep a sharp eye out for these markers. One day, the authorities of Singapore noticed that about $150,000 a year are spent to clean chewing gum. And it wasn't only under chairs and tables. They found it in critical areas on subway trains, which affected their sensors, causing delays. So, in 1992, gum was officially banned. The law has become more lenient toward tourists, with only small amounts allowed into the country. And dentists can also prescribe it to their patients for dental hygiene. There was also another issue in Singapore regarding cleanliness in public toilets. The authorities realized there were way too many messy public toilets throughout the country. This could no doubt put a stain on their reputation as one of the cleanest countries in the world. They enforced a monitoring system involving toilet agents. These guys monitor the toilets, making sure there are only clean ones. Business owners who fail to meet hygiene standards are reported. You're walking down a busy street in Thailand. You've dropped a money bill. The wind picks up and blows it away, and you chase it frantically. You get close enough to stop it, but make sure you don't use your foot. It's considered a great offense to step on the bill. Feet are considered low and dirty in Thailand. So you cannot step on the Thai money, since the bills have portraits of important people. No matter how great the value of your note is, don't tread on it. Otherwise, you'll find yourself locked up. Now, you speed your car along the Autobahn in Germany. It's one of the last places you can drive as fast as you like. But as you travel along, the fuel gauge shows the gas tank is empty. You pull over and stop. Not a big deal anywhere else, but here it's considered as an avoidable risk. You will have to pay a fine of $80 for not having the foresight to fill up when you had the chance. Further rules on the Autobahn include no parking, reversing, or even making a U-turn. Now back in the 40s, a pair of pickle packers were selling their wares in Connecticut. Their pickles weren't exactly edible, but they still tried to sell their out-of-date goods. 
they were soon caught, and a new law was put in place to avoid this problem in the future. The new requirement was made that for a pickle to be sold, it would have to bounce. This was the best way to check if they were safe to eat at the time, as preservation methods advanced the law was forgotten, but it's still in place today. It's late night in New York City, and you quickly run to the store. There's no point putting your shoes on, too much effort for such a short trip. But as you cross the road, you're suddenly stopped by the police. You're confused because you did nothing wrong but they quickly arrest you for the offense of wearing slippers past 10 p.m. This rule is in place as it's believed the smelly slippers attract rats and other vermin. Still, wearing your pajamas in public is fine. You're driving across the dry, sandy roads of Western Australia. You're hiding something suspicious inside your vehicle, hesitant as you go, hoping not to draw attention to yourself. Suddenly, you grow concerned as you're being pulled over by the Potato Marketing Authority. They search your vehicle and find that you're carrying more than 110 pounds of potatoes. This law was put in place in 1946 to protect commercial activities during a time of serious rationing. Although the law has since been removed, it wasn't until 2016. If you're planning a trip to the English House of Parliament, make sure you left your suit of armor at home. In the year 1313, it was declared that no one can enter fully knitted in their metal suits. It was made for safety reasons. It took a few years to take effect. At first, this new ruling was ignored by the Earl of Lancaster. But following his persecution for ignoring this law, there hasn't been any armor in Parliament since 1319. And the law remains in place to this day. So Greece has had many historical monuments that have stood the test of time. But the biggest concern to their ongoing stability is tourism. A law to counter this was to ban wearing high heels at any historical monuments. The Odeon, a theater made from stone, was built in 161 AD. Today, it has distinct damage caused by walking. Amongst the damage, they also found 60 pounds of chewing gum between the crevices. So food and drink are also banned, along with pointy shoes. You're flying a kite in the state of Victoria in Australia, a seemingly harmless activity. But don't be surprised if the police suddenly show up. A law was made in 1966, stating that if you flew a kite at the cost of annoying someone nearby, then you can be fined. And trust me, it's a pretty penny. But given the size of Australia, it should be pretty easy to find somewhere to fly a kite without anyone around. In Oklahoma, caring for dogs' well-being is valued highly, so much so that it's illegal to make strange faces toward a dog. You could be fined for doing this act and possibly face some serious punishment. Now, although strange, this one should definitely be made a universal rule. Unless the dog makes a face right back. Let's head to the Middle East. There's a large desert here, and it's completely dark, except for one spot. It's a big circle that glows with a bright orange light. The Darvaza Crater. And it's just a giant gas burner. Years ago, geologists found gas here, and they started mining for it. But when they excavated, they came across a void underground. The void collapsed, and it formed a crater. It's as wide as half a soccer field and as deep as a five-story building. Gas began to come out of the cracks in the crater. And since animals were often grazing near this place, the geologists decided to set these gas streams on fire to exhaust the source. Geologists thought the fire would be over in a day or two. But if you come here now, you'll see this gateway to the underworld is still burning. And it's been going on for almost 50 years. In 2013, a man descended to the bottom of the burning crater for the first time. He collected many different samples there, and scientists were able to find bacteria that aren't found anywhere else on Earth. They're quite comfortable at the bottom of this endless burning frying pan. In 2009, a man in L'Aquila, Italy, saw flickering lights dancing above the stone street. He immediately knew what to do and moved his family to a safer place. Only seconds later, a massive 8.3 magnitude earthquake hit the whole region. His knowledge of the strange lights saved his and his family's lives. 
So what are those mysterious warnings? For centuries, people interpreted the lights as something otherworldly. The scientific community didn't take them seriously, just put them down to a false recollection, a mind trick, or pure imagination. With the introduction of surveillance cameras and smartphones, the amount of evidence grew enormously. Now the connection was obvious. Lights appear and an earthquake hits. So experts finally started taking it seriously and started digging for the truth. But after years of research, to this day, geologists are still not fully sure what the source of the lights is, but they have recognized five types of them. Bright flashes that light up the sky, looking like storm lightning or a strong camera flash. Rays in the sky that can look like light columns. Different sized flames that come through the ground. Diffused glows over the mountains. And slow moving balls of light that can be misinterpreted as ball lightning. Another equally little understood atmospheric phenomenon. These are literal balls of lightning that can float and explode, leaving a sulfuric odor behind. But unlike ball lightning, these spherical EQLs seem to be harmless, if you don't count what's coming afterward. But with all these types of lights, experts can't know how exactly they're connected to earthquakes. They don't only show up before one hits. Some have been reported during and after earthquakes. They can also appear with other phenomena, like meteorite crashes, volcanic eruptions, or auroras. For now, scientists can only come up with theories to explain the unexplainable. One of the recent ones claimed the lights were electric lines being broken during an earthquake. But this theory doesn't explain how the phenomena was observed hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Like the ancient Chinese tale of dragon-looking clouds appearing in the sky as a warning of an upcoming quake. Or how an ancient Roman historian reported huge flame-like lights bursting out just before a huge earthquake occurred. The electric line theory was quickly dismissed. Another theory suggested it was escaping gas. During an earthquake, the underground rocks expand and shrink under pressure and heat. This opens and closes small spaces between them. Different gases make their way through these new openings. Radon, for example, can get released during seismic activity. It can ionize the air, making it electrically charged. But radon doesn't do it enough to create bright sparks of light. This theory is close, but doesn't quite hit the mark. One of the most accepted theories is that it might be from electricity traveling up from underground. When underground igneous rocks, ones that form from magma deep within the Earth, are under stress, they release ionized, or electrically charged, oxygen. It travels through the surface and up into the atmosphere, where it creates a localized electric field. That can produce brief flashes of visible light. Some aren't even that quick and can go on for minutes at a time. So there you are. You've been driving for hours through the night. You didn't have any chance to sleep, so your mind is hanging by a thread. You stop the car and go out to stretch your limbs. And then you look up into the sky and see a beautiful sunrise. Whoa, wait, there are three suns in the sky. You rub your eyes, but nope, there are still three bright stars in the sky. No, our home star hasn't been torn into three pieces, nor has it been visited by two other stars. This is called a sun dog. It occurs mostly during severe frosts. Small ice crystals in the sky bend the light. As a result, you may see three bright spots in the sky instead of just one. This phenomenon is officially called a halo. Usually, it's just a circle around the sun. You can even see a halo at night, too. Just look at a street lamp, and you'll see a bright circle around it. Sometimes, a halo can take on a fancier shape. If there's a lot of ice in the air, the light is warped even more. Just like in a room with a dozen mirrors. Then, the halo can take on the shape of a human eye. Because of this phenomenon, a false dawn can occur too. While you're looking at the horizon, the dawn begins, and the edge of the sun appears. A little bit more, and wait, the sun starts to just dissolve in the sky. After a few moments, it's dark again. And only a minute later, 
the real sun shows its face. It was the same light curvature effect you saw before with the three suns. Only now, the light is curved vertically, not horizontally. And instead of the real sun, its reflection in ice crystals in the sky appeared. And now moving on. This cloud looks like a dinosaur. And this one looks like a cat. And this, whoa, it looks like these clouds are falling down. Oh, phew, that's just a mammatus cloud. Their shape really makes them look like chunks of cloud about to slam on the ground. Well, that's not going to happen, but you better start seeking cover anyway. Such clouds are a sign of a severe thunderstorm coming. It takes a lot of moist air with ice crystals at the top and dry air at the bottom to create such clouds. Then, vertical currents of air appear between these layers. And these currents make the clouds take the shape of a human brain. <laughs> And this giant cloud looks like a dome that's going to cover an entire city. In fact, that's exactly what happens. A huge cloud covers a large area and then rains heavily on it. Sometimes, the front of such a cloud takes a bizarre shape, like in these pictures. It looks more like several giant spaghetti clouds, or even giant cloud worms. This phenomenon can often be seen in Australia, and it's called morning glory. It happens because a strong wind twists part of the cloud on both sides. And then, the huge sheet of air dough splits into thick strips. And sometimes, you can see clouds in the sky made of birds. Wow, that cloud moves quickly and changes shape. It becomes more transparent, but then denser and darker again. The birds seem to be involved in some kind of dance or performance. But they're not doing it for beauty or for the crowds of spectators gathered below. They're doing it for protection. When birds group themselves into such a cloud, they intimidate birds of prey. An eagle or hawk would have a hard time picking out a single target among the endless number of birds. And they move quickly, covering each other. Fish are huddled together in schools in the same way. Such a cloud might just spook a hungry predator. Grab some sunglasses and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts around 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many different ways. J-shaped trees might mean there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into this super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees unless you have superhuman strength. Another mystical phenomenon can be seen in the desert, a sand waterfall. When the wind brings a lot of sand to the edge of the canyon, it begins to fall down. Now amplify this effect 100 times and you get a sand waterfall in Saudi Arabia. It's really like Niagara Falls, only there's not a drop of water. The locals say this phenomenon warns of an impending sandstorm. If you see this padlock on your car, you might find a note attached with a number for you to call. The number is for a nearby scammer or thief, hoping you'll call so that they will charge you to remove the lock. Once you transfer the money, the scammers will give you information on where to find the key. It's usually not too far away from the car. They know that removing it yourself will cause damage to the paint. The best you can do is call the police immediately. Here are a few tricks up the car thief's evil sleeves they don't want you to be aware of. Older cars are their favorite, with decades of knowledge on how to access them. They understand those vehicles lack any alarms. They use manual window rollers and no tracking devices. The thought of a target as easy to steal as this is enough to cause them to salivate. Cars that are older than 20 years tick the box for all these red flags. Though you might think your car is so old that it's not worth much anyway, the thieves mostly want the parts. The parts in the old cars are worth a lot more than you would think. Supplying the valuable insides to the right buyer ensures they're worth the risk. An easy way to prevent your older car from being stolen is simply applying a steering wheel lock. The sight of that will deter anyone who's acting suspiciously nearby. The thieves' unfortunate attraction sometimes isn't towards the car itself, but what's within. Your iPad or other electronic devices clearly visible on the seat would be an easy steal. They're not bothered by quick smashing, grabbing, and running. 
A few hundred dollars of gear for a couple of seconds of work is a very appealing situation. So make sure you hide your valuables, preferably in one of the many hidden compartments, or lock them up in the trusty glove box. Statistically, one out of six car owners in safe neighborhoods keep a spare key inside the vehicle. Some owners think this is smart and can help save time in case they leave the primary key in the house. Bad guys stroll through unsuspecting neighborhoods late at night on a regular basis, checking every car just in case they hit that lucrative sixth car. Never be too careful with your keys. Public parking lots are extensive and can stretch over large areas. They're also a gold mine for those lurking quietly on the outer edges, eyeing off the cars furthest from the security cameras. Decent security is generally lacking at those large parking lots, so try to find the best spot closest to the shops. There are ways to park your car to make it problematic to tow or drive away. Park it so the front is facing inwards, ensuring there is an obstacle, like a light or a guardrail there. If you're parking on the street, turn the wheel towards the curb, locking it into place to make it harder to steal in every way. Would you believe those car thieves also have communities of their own? Each thief has their own specialty of a car brand or type. They will trade intel with the other crooks, so if their experience isn't enough to access your car, they will know someone who trades their knowledge for something viable in return. Cars with alarms are a great deterrent from thieves. If your car is a bit outdated, there's no harm in putting a fake sticker on it. The sticker alone is enough to discourage a would-be thief as they briefly scan the assortment at their disposal. Most people are sure that a newer car is safer, with groundbreaking technology to prove it. But ultimately, there are newer, more sophisticated forms of car theft. Keyless systems in cars use a random process through key fobs and smartphones. Using a short-range signal allows for the owner to access their vehicle and start the engine. Relay thieves will use wireless transmitters working as pairs. One will hold their gadget close to the owner, capturing a signal that specifically relates to the digital key. It then relays it to the target vehicle. The accomplice, standing closer to the car, obtains the relay signal, tricking the car into thinking the key is within range. Once the thief is inside the car, the process can be repeated, then easily starting the car. From there, the entire system can be reprogrammed to respond to a new key fob. They can use the same process by just opening the doors and accessing the valuable contents within the car. It ensures the thief can remove what they like without setting off any alarms or smashing any windows. A further form of deceiving these newer models is through their diagnostics. With all that that has been fitted into all cars within the last 10 years, copying the same technology and software allows systems to be simply understood and vulnerable. Computer experts easily develop devices that plug into key ports, booting up the vehicle software, and from there can program their own blank key fob. To avoid these new age concerns, keep cautious when leaving the car in a public area. Ensure you hear the locks functioning and inspect from a distance that there's no change with the side view mirrors. When you leave the keys overnight at your residence, wrap them in an aluminum tin or a signal blocking box, ensuring your car can't be hacked while you sleep. Or simply just turn off your fob when you're not using it. As technology continues to progress, applications will continue to develop. They will not only lock and start your car, but will be capable of controlling it. Those progressive technologies will bring along new advanced methods of accessing your car. To counter this, ensure all your software is updated and safeguard your entry code with something better than a password. Bad guys do prefer older vehicles, but keyless car thefts are growing exponentially. Today, most stolen car thefts are keyless. Thieves are quickly developing how to adapt to the new age of vehicles within their reach. Although there are protective measures in place for newer cars, The technology is only for the short term. When purchasing a newer model, always be open to whatever security options are available. Who knows what the future will hold for the safety of your smart car? Consider buying a baby monitor and hiding it in the back seat. It will ensure you have a very affordable surveillance monitoring system ready to alert you of a sudden break-in. Hot wiring older cars is the main form of stealing them. So install an off switch to your car's engine. A professional can install them for you in multiple locations in your car. 
They will ensure that the power has no way of reaching the ignition of your car, and no thieves will be able to drive away with it. Install a removable wheel and take it with you when not using your car. Thieves won't carry around their own spare steering wheel, regardless of how talented they think they are. A wheelless car will make certain thieves will stay clear. A steering lock is also a great option. It completely covers your wheel and functions similarly to the wheel lock for older cars. Extended stays in a parking lot could still be a risk without a steering wheel. A tire lock is a great alternate option. Although it takes a long time to install, it will serve as an excellent way to deter the bad guys as they won't be able to drive away in your car. Given how fast the criminal must act to get into a car and escape, they don't have the time to search the vehicle for any tracking devices. Although older cars lack this technology, they're easily available to purchase. You can easily hide a GPS tracker, some of them smaller than a phone, inside your car. It will give you and the authorities an advantage when tracking down your beloved ride. In the USA, a car is stolen on average every 36 seconds. The top 10 cars stolen are the Dodge Pickup, Honda CRV, Toyota Corolla, GMC Pickup, Nissan Altima, Toyota Camry, Honda Accord, Honda Civic, Chevrolet Pickup, and the Ford Pickup. A $7.4 billion loss was estimated in 2020 due to car thefts. It was the highest amount in 10 years, and it's logical to expect that the number will continue to grow further. Given the range of cars within the thieves' target area, it's clear that all cars are potential targets. Is your car on the list? In many cities and forests, there are color markings on trees that look weird to an unknowing spectator. In fact, most such markings are used for two reasons. To make the trees to be cut or left alone stand out from the rest, and to make an owned forest boundary line visible. There are no specific rules for the color or shape of markings, but the most universal ones for cutting are blue lines, and the markings for preserving trees are usually orange or yellow. Trees within city limits are usually marked for cutting with red, orange, or yellow lines or dots. If you see such a marking on a tree and you have a car parked nearby, best move it somewhere farther away so that the tree doesn't fall on it when it's cut down. Trees in a forest can be marked for preserving because they have good cavities for wildlife to make homes in, or there are nests on their branches. It's a frequent practice to leave the surrounding trees intact too, so that the birds and animals in that particular tree are not disturbed. Large and healthy seed and nut-bearing trees are also marked for preserving because many animals and birds feed on their seeds and nuts. Unhealthy trees can be preserved too, surprisingly, if woodpeckers seem to like them. It means there are many bugs inside those trees that the birds use as food. Color markings on trees in a forest might also mean someone owns the forest up to a certain boundary and decided to show it. These markings can be made in any color and shape, but they always have two specific features you can't miss. One is that the markings go in a more or less straight line, which is logical because it's a boundary of a territory. And the second feature is that, according to the marking rules, the markings always have to be close to each other, so that the next one is clearly visible from the one you're looking at in both directions. Some believe that yellow markings are left on female ginkgo trees growing around cities of the U.S., but there's no hard evidence of that. Still, you can find a detailed map of such trees in New York or Washington, D.C., for example. Female ginkgos do deserve a map of their own, since they bear fruit that smell really, really awful. If you ever had a piece of butter gone rancid in your kitchen, you probably know that odor. The trees were brought to the U.S. in the 18th through 19th centuries, when a drive for experimentation and all things exotic was going strong. And since ginkgos are very sturdy trees and can withstand harsh conditions, they grew popular in the country. Many cities planted them for green decoration purposes, but unfortunately, lots of them turned out to be females. To avoid the trees bringing their unpleasant smell into the cities, they've been sprayed with a special solution that prevents them from fruiting. The solution is safe for both people and animals, so there's no need to worry about being in the vicinity while maintenance workers spray the trees. Color markings can be seen in the streets too, not only on trees. 
If you walk around the town and see a red line on the pavement, for example, it means there's a power line or cable beneath you. These lines are marked red to stand out the most, because if they're damaged while digging, it can lead to a lot of trouble, maybe even more than with gas pipes. Orange lines mean essentially the same, only those signify there's a telecommunication or signal line or cable. These things don't carry power, so disrupting them is not as bad as damaging power cables, but it would still cause a lot of inconvenience to people around the block. For example, breaking a fiber optic cable might shut down the internet in a large area until the damage is repaired. A yellow line means there's natural gas, oil, steam, petroleum, or some other conduit of flammable material underneath. Lines are usually drawn in such a way as to show the direction the pipe is laid down below, and the line itself is in its center. Yellow is as much a color of warning as red, which makes perfect sense. A broken gas pipe and a spark are a recipe for a huge disaster. Green lines signify there's a sewer or storm drain underground. Breaking a sewer facility can cost an excavation worker their entire career, and for a good reason. Imagine what kind of a mess it would result in. And apart from the sewer contents breaking free and creating chaos on the surface, damaging the pipeworks will almost certainly result in huge costs of repairs and lots of inconvenience for hundreds of people living close by. Since water is blue, it makes sense for city markings signifying a source of drinking water to be blue too. Damaging such a source is not as bad as breaking a petroleum pipe or a power cable, but it still is a cause of trouble for people around. In big cities, though, it's more of a nuisance than something serious, because potable water is normally easily accessible. Breaking a water pipe or main brings more problems to the excavating or construction project itself. The water will flood the surroundings, making it a mess to deal with as quickly as possible. Purple markings also mean water, but not of a drinking kind. Lines of this color signify there's a source of irrigation or reclaimed water down below. Such water is taken from sandblasting or power washing and is normally used for industrial or gardening purposes afterwards. It's not meant for drinking, but the results of breaking through a pipe carrying this water are pretty much the same as with potable water. The mess will be more than real. Pink markings on the ground are left by land surveyors. When there's a legal argument for property limits, for example, an independent surveyor will leave pink lines on the ground to mark the boundaries. These can also be left at proposed construction sites for the same reason. White lines, dots, and crosses mark out the territory for proposed excavation routes or limits. It means there will soon be digging done within those premises. White markings usually indicate the exact place the excavation should be done at. They're the first step before any actual work can be performed. Later, city maintenance workers will find out if there are any facilities beneath that spot that should be avoided. If there are none, or if there's no conflict between the digging and the underground facilities, more about that later, the excavation can begin. City markings can also be drawn not as lines, but as other shapes. For instance, you might see an H shape on the ground. The two parallel lines signify the edges of the pipe or cable below, while the center line connecting them is there to make it easier to measure the width. There might also be the name of the company that laid down the pipe or cable next to the H shape. A diamond shape is another frequent marking on the ground. It might or might not have two parallel lines marking the edges of the conduit below while the diamond shape itself means the approximate size of the thing beneath your feet. Some markings look more like graffiti, with lots of cryptic symbols and letters, but these are usually abbreviations and signs for the city maintenance or construction workers. For example, you might see a white cross or square drawn on the ground to mark a proposed excavation site. The workers will often write a no, followed by an abbreviated name of the facility below. You might think it means no excavation should be done here, but it's the exact opposite. No means no conflict between the power lines, pipes, or whatever other facility is buried underneath and the proposed excavation plan. The abbreviations are also written in the color of the facility they designate. For instance, if there's no G written in yellow paint in a white square, it means the site can be excavated without fearing that a gas pipe below hence the G, will be disturbed. 
And if there's a telecommunications cable underneath, the city services will often draw an orange no, and then an abbreviated name of the company that laid down the cable. Another way to say the same thing is to draw an abbreviated facility type and cross it out. A yellow G, sometimes in a circle, means a gas pipe below. And if it's crossed out, there should be no worries about excavating in this area. No gas pipes will be damaged. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends.